Professor Sarki Greve, the Executive Dean, Faculty of Education, Professor Caroline Long uh, in the tea tonight, Dr. Piera Bicke, the respondent from UNISA, warm with a welcome as well, senior leaders of the university, members of Senate and other academics, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Sunny Bonani, Guyanand, good evening, Tobela. It's indeed a great honor and special privilege for me to welcome you to the professorial inaugurational lecture of Professor Caroline Long. As I do so, I wish to express a warm welcome to her loved ones, <coughs> apologies, special guests and her colleagues. This is indeed a proud and joyful, yet a landmark moment for all of you, for Professor Long and of course for us here at UJ and higher education in South Africa and beyond. The inauguration of professors is a public ceremony in which newly appointed professors are inducted into office by the Vice Chancellor and deliver the inaugural addresses. The ceremony has its roots in the medieval university and serves multiple purposes. Two of those purposes are as follow. Firstly, it's an expression of welcome and an entry for new professors joining the circle of colleagues who are already professors. And secondly, it provides a platform for the professors to display their expertise in the discipline and showcase their research. Today we gather to bear witness to the entry of Professor Long to the illustrious community of scholars at the University of Johannesburg. It is a celebration of the contributions to the discipline and ultimately the impact on society. Professors provide the university with its identity, character and academic legitimacy and integrity. The inaugural lecture is a rite of passage following the confirmation of the appointment of the person as a professor. This evening, we will listen to Professor Long as the gown goes to town. <laughs> what we mean by that, ladies and gentlemen, is that the power of the inaugural address is when the expertise is showcased beyond the corridors of the university and reverberates within society. It stands out as a moment of pride for the incumbent, the family, fellow scholars, the university and ultimately society. For the German philosopher and diplomat Humboldt, a university referred to as the whole community of scholars and students engaged in a common search for truth. Newman talked about teaching universal knowledge. Recently, universities have been viewed as instrumentalist, serving the purpose of the economy or utilitarian in purpose. I would hope that we can break out of these narrow conceptualizations and reflect on the university as contributing to the public good. Edward said in an article on defiance and taking positions offers a formulation of the ideal role of the true intellectual as follows, and I quote, one who commands a vast knowledge of his, her discipline, who is rigorous in the analysis of literature, who views being an intellectual as a vocation, the intellectual who considers it's necessary to step into the public sphere and to speak truth to power namely to question, interpret, and understand authority rather than consolidating it, to step out of the boundaries of the academy to connect oneself, to affiliate oneself, to align oneself with an ongoing process or contest of some sort, perhaps with the aim of improving the lot of the oppressed. The intellectual will function as a kind of public memory to recall what is forgotten or ignored, to make the connections that are otherwise hidden and to provide alternatives for mistaken policies." End of quote. It remains then for us as a university with a pan-African vision to derive our mandate as intellectuals and as professors. The question does arise, how do we embrace the role of a professor as a disruptor while continuing to be a flagship carrier of our disciplines? This evening, we will listen to Professor Long as one further step in the journey of being a professor. This is a journey which does not culminate once this lecture has been given. It is a self-reflective pause in the journey of the professor, with a promise of more to enrich our minds and simultaneously contributing to the rich intellectual body of work in the specific discipline. Let me now invite the Executive Dean, Professor Sarki Gravit, to introduce Professor Long. I thank you. Riala Boga, Sia Bonga, Baie Danki. Thank you, Professor Swart. 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed my pleasure to introduce Professor Caroline Long tonight. So Caroline was awarded a PhD in mathematics education from the University of Cape Town in 2011. She is currently a professor in the Faculty of Education in the Department of Childhood Education here at the University of Johannesburg. She is a two-rated a C2 rated scientist with the National Research Foundation. And then in 2012, she was awarded a high distinction by the University of Western Australia for the introductory and advanced courses in rush measurement theory. Prior to working at UJ, Caroline held a position at the University of Pretoria, spanning both the Center for Evaluation and Assessment, Deputy Director, and the Science, Mathematics and Technology Education Department from 2006. From 2001 to 2005, she held positions at the University of the Witwatersrand, at the Marang Centre and in the Education Faculty. Caroline has served on the Qualification Standards Committee for Umalusi since 2013, the South African Mathematics Olympiad Committee from 2013, and the Sahira Special Interest Group for Assessment from 2015. She is currently a member of the Psychology of Mathematics Education Organizing Committee and co-chair for the International Congress of, uh, of Mathematics Education. Caroline has presented at many local and international conferences and published extensively in local and international journals in mathematics education. She also published in the field of rush measurement theory and also in teacher education. The book, Learning Pathways Within the multi <laughs> Multiplicative, suddenly this word lo looked very strange, <laughs> Multiplicative Conceptual Field, Insights Reflected Through a Rush Measurement Framework based on her PhD was published as part of a series, Empirische Studien zur Didaktik, Dur Mathematik, in my best German, uh, in 2015. Uh, uh, important recent uh, publication is a book chapter co-author with Tindan, Understanding Monitoring Systems in Different Contexts, a focus on curriculum development, teacher agency and monitoring systems, and this was published in 2017. Caroline's current teaching at the University of Johannesburg includes third year mathematics methodology and honors courses in assessment and in evaluation and research methods. She also supervises an honors group whose projects involve, uh, involve designing a test and applying rush measurement theory. It is the teaching and interaction with students that she does her most creative work. And it is also then indeed a pleasure that some of her students are here tonight. Uh, so wonderful to have you here. Caroline, we look forward to your address. Okay, thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you for those who've come for a long, from a long distance. And um, yeah, thank you everybody else. First, I would like to thank the University of Johannesburg the executive of the university, Professor Swartz, the Dean of Education, Professor Sari, Sarki Gravit, and, um, and all those, uh, and all of you who've taken time to attend. Um, and yeah, I'm most relieved that I've got my students here, and I've got my close family here, and yeah, now I can relax. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, there's a quote by uh, Lord Alfred Lord Tennyson. I was a part of all that I am a part of all that I have met, yet all experience is an arch where through gleams the, that untravelled world whose margin fa fades forever and forever when I move. From a childhood in the bushveld up north, through teenage years in the foothills of the southern Drakensberg, and then into the wider world, University of Natal. UCT, WITS, UP, and now the University of Johannesburg, I have I've gained experience and insights that have informed my work. The opportunities, um, yeah, the opportunities to engage further afield, Western Australia, France, Germany, 
India and the United States have influenced my thinking about research and education quite dramatically. I would like to uh, acknowledge my parents. <laughs> Sorry. My father and mother, and you can, you can read it in the you can read it in the book. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge my brother Philip, my childhood companion, who who keeps me on the ground, literally, when walking walking in the mountains. And there's a trickle of water coming down the mountain, and he challenges me. He says, "How long will it take for this water to fill that dam?" And while I'm wishing that I've got my pencil and paper and searching my head for some formulae that I learned at school long ago or at, or that in, at university, um, he's come up with the answer. I would uh, like to acknowledge my husband and longtime friend, Kenneth McKenzie, who gives me 100% support in everything I, I do. My daughters, Anna James and Maya James, have made their own paths, engaging with the many challenges of the 21st century. Um, I learn from them. Um, I've also, along the way, collected some other children, three sons who are in faraway countries, Haika and Bali, who's here tonight, and Sandile, and then some more. Um, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues throughout the years who have shared ideas and listened to newly formed and roughly conceptualized ideas, especially those who, with, who, with whom I've published and um, s some of who are here this evening. I would uh, like to acknowledge Tim Dunn, uh, who many of you know, who passed on before his time. Um, I yeah, I'd also like to thank people here. You will recognize, some of you will recognize in my, in my presentation um, the inputs that you've made along the way. Okay, so the title of my, the title of my presentation uh, mathematics as a creative activity was, uh, was inspired by Whitehead, one of the great mathematicians of the, 20, of the 20th century. He warned against uncritical adoption of ideas, against inert ideas that are merely received into the mind without being utilized or tested or thrown into fresh combinations. He proposes that there are three phases of, of an education cycle, that of playing with ideas, of exactness and of abstracting general principles. He explains that the reason for throwing ideas and facts into fresh combinations is to help students understand the relationships, interconnections and patterns, and so make the knowledge their own. Without the first play phase, the next two, precision and generalization, are almost impossible. I'm sure my students who are here will recognize some of what happens in the class when you listen to this talk. Um, this phase ties in very well with the work of the French and Dutch mathemati mathematics education movements in that mathematics starts with the child, their current thinking, and the experiences they encounter in the out of, uh, the experience out, outside of school. The second part of the title is mapping a conceptual field for mathematics teacher education. In attempting to map a conceptual field for math teacher education, I propose that there are many domains and constructs that, re that require attention in order to prepare the student teacher for the education environment in which they will work. I first focus on the topic good education, drawing on the work of Gert Bister, and for that I have to thank um, Pitima. Then make the link to teacher education, referring to the work of Punambatra, and against this broad focus, I position reform mathematics education, focusing mainly on Gerard Venu's theory of conceptual fields. Assessment and measurement are critical components of the broader domain of mathematics teacher education, as is research design, and are thus included. I elaborate these topics, maintaining that doing mathematics is a creative activity. Well, many of you might not think that, but in fact, probably a lot of people in this room do think that. Okay, and, and um, I'm hoping that all, all the students who leave my classes think that. Um, and if doing mathematics is a creative activity, then the teaching of mathematics and the teaching of prospective mathematics teachers must certainly be. F 
Finally, mathematics teacher education is presented as including all of the above as necessary for supporting perspe prospective teachers. Okay. So in an inaugural lecture at the University of Stirling, Kat Bester raised the important question, what is good education? He insists that this is a normative question requir which requires judgments about what we consider desirable. The stand is entirely different from considering a high score on the TIMS study, for example, and concluding that we have a good education system. Or alternatively, achieving a low score on the TIMS study and concluding we are failing our children. Even if we consider the TIMS study to have valid measures, our judgment on whether we have a good education system must be premised on what we value. It would be short-sighted to, for example, rearrange our primary school program to include more mathematics and less art and music. Sonkanise, where are you? <laughs> um, uh, based on the performance on TIMS. We need to ask, as Bista does, the deeper question as to whether such studies measure what, what we value, or rather, are, va are measuring, or, or, or rather, are we valuing only what we can measure? Okay, so, so a best to distinguishes three functions of education: qualification, which is the one we most used to; socialization, which we also understand; but the third. It w is what I think he thinks is the most important and which, which I value highly. The third, the individuation or subjectification function might perhaps best be understood as the opposite of the socialization function, should be a way, ways in which education makes a contribution to human freedom. The statement that any education system worthy of its name should always allow for forms of individuation and subjectification and that allow those being educated to become more autonomous and independent in their thinking is certainly pertinent to the mathematics classroom. I don't think you can have somebody in the mathematics classroom who's obeying orders. I'm sure certainly they have to be in control of their, of their own thinking. We might propose democratization of the classroom, which by no means implies a lack of attention to rigor, mathematics teachers. Um, the beauty of mathematics, I'm sure you'll all agree, is that it applies its own rigour through logical reasoning, which I maintain, as other others do, is intrinsic to the individual. I say to my students, um, don't believe me, don't believe what your other lecturers tell you, rather, does it make sense? Is it logical? Are you, is it, are you coming to the, are, are, are you finding a conclusion that's satisfactory based on your own logical reasoning? Um, okay, so now <coughs> concurrently with, this, with, with uh, Bista's address, in 2009, Poonam Batra from the University of Delhi, India, presented an outline of a model for teacher education that privileged the notion of agency and the empowerment of teachers India, like South Africa, has attained a measure of political independence, though the question to be asked is whether the associated degree of autonomous and independent thinking has translated into educational thinking. Batra propo proposed that teacher empowerment was a necessary condition for quality education and social transformation. Okay, I might just slip uh, no, I'm going to read. I'm going to read this one. Um, in the in the work ab um, listed above, the term agency is defined as the dynamic competence of a person to act independently and to make choices in order to advance advance towards their goals. Um, the two other aspects of this construct as understood in this context, are advanced by Bista and Teda. And the first is that agency is not intrinsic to the person. We often make things very personal. We say this person's, you know, got agency, this person can achieve, whereas that person, uh, we're not so sure about that person. 
But what Bistra and Tedder say is that in agency is, occurs interactively with the environment. And that therefore it is the environment uh, that we in teacher education create that can either enable or constrain agency. Um, a further constituent of the working construct agency is that for any individual, the exertion of agency would be dependent on a triad of factors. Past experience, current constraints and affordances, and future goals and visions. We know there is little to be done about past experiences, and changing our current contexts has possibly more constraints than affordances, but vision of the future is unlimited. I maintain that it is this aspect of the triad that can most effectively harness the agency of our students. And uh, my students will attest to the fact that in just about all my courses, I ask them for a vision. What is your vision of maths education? Have you got a vision of where education can go? And I think that is the engine which will pull our, pull our education um, system. Again, to draw on Bista, good education should at least be able to empower everyone to engage in such crucial deliberations as the shape, form, and directions of our collective endeavors, our communities, society, and country, and not forgetting the rest of the world. Okay, so um, I will just, I will not talk to the words here, I will just say, uh, just talk a little bit about P Punambatra. I read her 2009 article in 2010. She was out here at a, at a conference and was so impressed with her article because I thought she's really, um, she's really got, a, got a, a plan here that can change education. And in India, she's a very powerful woman and she actually has taken charge of the teacher education in India. But her central, her central idea is that of agency. She's, she claims, she says that uh, agency, teacher empowerment, and I say stroke agency, and good education are, uh, are intricately combined. There is no, you cannot separate those two. So in essence, if you take her course, she her whole course is designed around enabling agency in her students. She gets students from all the castes in India and from all places in India and out of her course comes, teach came, comes teachers who are inspired, empowered and who can take the education program forward. There are a lot of ideas that I've taken from her in, in my classes. The one uh, that, that I was inspired by her is that showing the students the movie, The Hidden Figures. Now, Hidden Figures is about the three African-American women in the NASA space program. And these three women are brilliant mathematicians and they do extremely well despite constraints. Now, the interesting thing is that this book only came out about five years ago or seven years ago. And so they were hidden. Their contributions to the NASA space program were hidden for some 50 years, right? So um, when, when, my, when I showed this film to the students and I asked some of them, well, actually the previous class last year, I said, why do you think I showed you this movie? And the, uh, one of my students, Mbata, said to me, uh, I think it was to give us courage, ma'am. And it certainly was um, to, uh, to, to give them courage. Okay, now the, the particular environment that uh, Punambatra creates is, I think, uh, definitely conducive to what reform mathematics proposes. Reform mathematics has brought the human and creative element into the learning and teaching of mathematics. It has privileged the experience that children bring with them of their out-of-school environments and sought to develop their mathematical thinking. Now the question I ask, and, and as a question going forward, how is it that when we have had a movement for reforming mathematics education for almost 50 years, why is it that we still have the perception 
of mathematics as boring or of no relevance for the majority of people. The question arises why reform mathematics has not had greater impact on mathematics education. Okay, so, so in this um, section on reform mathematics education, I look at, at, well, I've got four, a list of four, four groups here. Well, first of all, it's the theory of conceptual fields. And this was formulated by Gérard Venu, and he builds on the work of Piaget and other French didacticians, for example, Brousseau. Um, alongside that theory of conceptual fields is realistic maths education movement that was started in, in the Netherlands. Now these two, for, those of, for, for most people, these two are quite well aligned. There's a lot of similarities, a lot of parallels. If you look very closely, you'll see that the French flavour definitely comes through in the theory of conceptual fields. and, and and the, I suppose the Dutch flavour, uh, uh, quite obviously, comes uh, through in realistic maths education. Now, um, the Dutch, I suppose, are more happy to speak English, and so uh, the, the realistic maths education has found its way into, into the uh, English-speaking world, whereas the theory of conceptual fields has found its way into Canada, into Spain, into the Spanish-speaking world, into the Portuguese-speaking world, but not much in the English-speaking world. And in my PhD, when I was looking for these readings, I found a few in, Engl in, in, in English, but I was really at a dis disadvantage because I couldn't speak French. So those of us in the audience who can speak French, you've got a role to play. Okay, um, then the problem-solving approach has had propon proponents in se several continents and also its counterpart in South Africa. I have to um, salute... Uh, Hanley Murray, Alvain Olafir and Pitt Hillman from the 90, who worked in the 1980s and 1990s on problem-centred mathematics teaching and much more, and who are still working uh, today on problem-centred mathematics teaching. And then the fourth person, who doesn't s seem to fit into any particular category, but because he's really a practitioner, Zalman Oziskin from the University of Chicago School's Mathematics Project. He's the director of this project and, in fact, spends, uh, I don't know, at least three months, six months of every year in the classroom teaching and trialing the University of Chicago School's Mathematics Project's materials to see if they're going to work. And I think that is certainly something that, that we can learn from. Okay, but now... To go to the theory of conceptual fields, um, Gerard Venu, uh, he, uh, he, he, he says he's an old communist. <laughs> he lives in a flat on the fifth story in a Paris apartment, but he also, like most Parisians, has got a country, country home. But anyway, he says that mathematical concepts are rooted in situations and problems. And from a conceptual perspective, a single concept may be applied in, in many different problem situations, and one situation or problem may require many distinct concepts. So that's what makes mathematics complicated, isn't it? It's not a one-to-one. -one. You can't say, I'm going to teach you this, and, therefore, and then you can solve that. It's not a one-to-one. -one. From a cognitive perspective, a single concept does not develop in isolation, but invariably dis develops in relationships with other concepts. So from this point, you can't say, I'm going to teach fractions today, and then over with fractions, then I'm going to teach ratio tomorrow, and then over with ratio. Because as um, uh, you know, anyone teaching mathematics will know that they, all these concepts are interconnected. So Venu defines a conceptual field as a set of situations, the, masterings of which, the mastering of which requires mastery of several mathematical concepts of different natures. So mathematics, mathematical proficiency is developed through encountering situations or problems that are carefully designed for the purpose of learning. The requirement 
is a set or bulk of situations which provide the context for the learner to become familiar with the concept, but which also require particular mathematical structures to, uh, to solve the inherent problem. I'm going to give an example a little, little bit later where, where I've um, acted this one, where, where I've, I've done this with, this with my students. So there are two purposes for engaging with situations. The, Ameri the French call it situations. Um, my students reinterpreted, they called it scenarios. And maybe sc scenarios is a better word for us. Um, and yeah, anyway, the first is to illustrate a concept by providing a context at the cognitive level of the child. And the second is to expand the existing con uh, conceptual structures of the child through extending the complexity of the mathematical situation beyond the child's current level of mastery. So, um, yeah, so the concepts and theorems making up the formal abstract and therefore powerful mathematics have their cognitive counterparts in concepts in action and theorems in action. So on the one side, we've got the concepts and theorems, and the French use of the word theorems is a, is a little bit looser than we in our school think of it. We think we have to, a theorem has to be something, you know, have a proof and, and it's set out like this and you get 10 marks for it if you get it right and you get, <laughs> you get marks off if you don't get it right. But they think of theorems more as chains of reasoning. Okay, these cognitive counterparts provide entry points for individuals to solve problems that may initially seem beyond their current knowledge. So I'm always surprised, and I'm sure um, maths, uh, we, we often are, how when you challenge a student with a particular question that makes sense to them, how intelligent they are. Okay, acknowledgement of, the cog of this cognitive capacity resonates with the notion of autonomy, independent thinking and agency and makes an important contribution to the mathematical, mathematics classroom. The role of the teacher then, according to Venu, is to transform the learner, learner's intuitive and localised conceptions that can be applied to a single problem into generalised and explicit concepts that can be applied to a class of problems. So it's not just about um, solving small problems or uh, solving problems that are known to the student. The problems that are, known, are familiar to the student are used as a stepping stone for, for the higher mathematics. Okay, so I, I won't go into the realistic mathematics because all, all that I'm going to say about that is that there are parallels. Um, okay, we've done. Oh, I'm going, am I going the wrong way? Okay, then just to say that in my teaching, while the theory of conceptual fields has been very important, I've also uh, taken Zalman Oziskin's work as um, guiding, uh, to, to guide me. He, he wrote an article in 2005, which uh, Craig Ponaro will know, the transition years, because when we were working at WITS, we um, found that article quite useful. And I still find it, what's, what's it? 15 years later, useful. I'm not sure if you still find it useful, Craig. Um, but these transitions are made during the year, from the years grade te grade six to grade 10. And if these transitions are not made, then learners resort to rote learning. So those of us who struggled with maths, well, um, I was lucky enough to jump the hoops, but for people, <laughs> for people who struggled with maths, uh, the, what happened at the end of grade six? What happened at the end of grade seven? Yeah. You probably did very well up to the end of grade six or the end of grade seven, and then suddenly you hit a wall. And Oziskin will say, you didn't make those transitions. You didn't make the transitions from whole number to real number. You could work with whole numbers, you could add and subtract your multiplication and division, but when it came to fractions, you fell apart, right? The next one, from a number to a variable, you could do your arithmetic, but then suddenly when they threw in the X's and the A's and the B's and the C's, you thought, what is going on here? 
Why do I have to know? Why do I want to know about that X? <laughs> okay. And then from properties of individual figures to general properties of classes of figures, here this is geometry, right? You could work out the, the angles Add, you could work out the angles if you had to add the, if they gave you the numbers. But when you had to prove why this angle here was equal to that angle over there, it was, it was, it became quite difficult. Anyway, incorporating, yeah. So, so these transitions are what I incorporate in my maths methodology class. So, at the moment, we've just gone through the first two, and the others are, st are still to come. So incorporating both Oziskin's transitions and the theory of conceptual fields into the mathematics met methodology class provides both a mathematical direction and a means to get there. Okay. Final one. So now, um, you'll see from my, from my CV that I've also had an interest in, in assessment and measurement. And, and I've got the subtitle there, Conceptualising a Trajectory. Now, assessment and a measurement are very important features in the, educa in the education process for both the teachers and the students. Lecturers here, you will know how important those marks are to the students. Students here, you know how important those marks are. A formative assessment approach will require that we know a student's current level of understanding, we have a goal in mind, and we will take the steps to achieve that goal. A summative approach may signal a specific point on an achievement scale. But whatever the approach we're taking, a trajectory of development implying less than and greater than is required. Using Oziskin's transitions as a model, we would need to identify the steps along the way from competency with whole number to competency with rational number, and later on, competence with real numbers. And that's where, um, yeah. And though a conceptual field approach may be less linear in that learners may attain different concepts within the conceptual <coughs> field at different times, we still need some verification of the process that's being made. Okay, so the construct measurement implies invariance, okay, stability across contexts, right, that things stay the same, and a unit of measure. We understand these properties in the physical sciences, but applying the properties in the social sciences is more complex. Nevertheless, assessment and testing must adhere to particular criteria for measurement before we are able to claim measurement. In Roche measurement theory, the classical theory of measurement is foregrounded. And because of this requirement, the theory provides an incisive lens with which to check the validity of our claims when collecting data. The model has a distinctive feature in that both item difficulty and learner proficiency are aligned on the same scale. Now, I used the Roche model in my PhD, and um, so it was based on the multiplicative, a horrible word to say, conceptual field. So multiplicative simply means everything to do with m multiplication and division. So my uh, PhD focused on everything to do with multiplication and division, and everything that used multiplication and division, ratio, rate, et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, a colleague of mine from, uh, well, she wasn't a colleague of mine at that time, somebody arrived from Germany, Heike Wendt, and she said, why don't we do a Roche analysis of your data? By this time, I tested some students. She said, why not do a Roche analysis? And I didn't have a clue what Roche analysis was, uh, was about. But anyway, we persevered. And I'll just explain one concept from Roche measurement theory, and that is that the person proficiency and the item difficulty are aligned on the same scale. So here, uh, let's look here. Okay, so, so on the right, those are the items of increasing difficulty. Easy item at the bottom, difficult item at the top. Likewise, people down here, a low proficiency. Notice we use the word proficiency, not ability because proficiency I I implies that they're not yet there, 
whereas ability might have a stronger connotation of innateness. And then at the top, we've got somebody of high proficiency. Now the relationship of somebody here with that item is based on probabilistic theory that this person would have a 50% chance of getting that item right. So it's ba and would have a greater than 50% chance of getting these items right, and obviously less than 50% chance of getting those items right. So there's a mathematical formula that puts this together, which those of you missed, where Dr. Malloy, where is he? Yeah. <laughs> he uh, okay, there you are, yeah. He, he's worked extensively in this area, and um, um, yeah, and, uh, and we've done some collaboration there. Okay, so, but what that enabled me to do, so it's interesting in itself, but what it enabled me to do was to actually put together a matrix, which at the top shows high proficiency and there low proficiency. And then down here, we have easy items, add and subtract items. So I analyzed all the items that, that the students did for what was actually in the item. And then down here, we have algebra, more complex things. So you'll see that there could be a line drawn across here or an ellipse along here. Because if this was your class and you had people of high proficiency and people of low proficiency, at the same time as pushing the people of high proficiency in this area, you would have to make sure that people of low proficiency are catching up in this area. So this is what I tell people. This was my PhD. That's it. <laughs> One page. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> OK. Um, so and then um, next uh, in what, what's into this, as you can see, I'm building up this conceptual field which I called, which isn't really in Venu's term a conceptual field, but what it says to me is what are those elements that I find important in my mathematics teaching? What are all the different things that I find are important? Okay, so the final thing then is this a research approach. Venu proposes a canonical approach to research in mathematics education, which involves, first of all, identifying and classifying situations designed to illuminate mathematical concepts and theorems from a mathematical perspective. So he's, um, yeah, okay. And then from a cognitive development perspective, we analyze the developmental complexity of learner responses in terms of mathematical concepts in action and theorems in action. Now, the concepts in action, so for example, a concept might be a fraction. A concept in, in action would be how that student actually uses their existing knowledge to cope with that concept. And I think what we're saying here is that students don't come with nothing into the mathematics classroom. They come with a lot into that mathematics classroom. And what, what the theory of conceptual field says, that if you provide the right situation, um, you c or the right scenario, as my students say, you be, will be able to pull them into that, um, into that concept. Okay, a next phase involves collecting data on the ways children articulate their reasoning, thereby identifying links between the mathematical concepts and the cognitive processes. Now, I know maths education people in this country are um, and the, uh, collecting data all the time to try and work out where are our students having problems, what can we do about that. I know a recent worry that all of us have had is place value at the at the lower levels, and, um, and, and we're looking to see how we can, as a community, as a maths education community, help uh, improve that. Okay, the fourth phase is con con uh, constructing symbolic representations. And uh, Venu, if you go into his work, you can also see that in, in my work, he's got very interesting diagrams which help unpack the relationships between um, the different parts of uh, problems. And the fifth phase it goes back to the beginning again, design new, ma new, new, new materials. Okay, so now I, I was uh, doing prac teaching, going into schools doing prac teaching, and I found um, that a student 
was having a lot of trouble teaching place value to grade ones. It was really not a successful lesson. It was uh, very, very difficult. The little children were really acting up and being so naughty. And I thought of Hanley Murray's, uh, st uh, Henry, Henley, Henley, Henley Murray. She said, if your class is being naughty, you're either pitching your, your, your uh, lesson too high or too low. And that's all that there is to it. So what is this about discipline? It's uh, you're either too high or you're too low. I know when I get it exactly right with my maths methodology class, they are very quiet. I know that if they're a bit confused, they're noisy. If they're a bit bored, they're on their cell phones. <laughs> okay, so, th so, so this was a problem. I thought, I'm a responsible university academic. I've seen this problem in the classroom. So what do I do? I have to find a solution. I have to think about how can this be solved. So I had a sleepless night. I went to KZN for the weekend and I had a chat with my farmer friends and relations in KZN. I said, and we talked about how a farmer works out his maize yield. How does he work out how what his maize yield is going to be from, for example, 10 hectares? So what is the process? He walks through the field, collects 20 random cobs. I'm sure all of you know what a mealy cob looks like, right? And then you count the mealy on those 20 cobs. You count the mealies on those 20 cobs. So I had, I brought these 20 cobs to the classroom and my students, <laughs> first of all, they counted the, the on the individual cob. And there were three of them in the group and the task was they had to get the same answer, right? So the three in the group had to come up with the same answer. And you can imagine it's very difficult because they, they are in sort of rows, but they aren't in exact rows. You <laughs> and some, some tried to multiply and some tried to, you know, mark each little mealy with a blue pen. And there were all kinds of things, right? There were all kinds of things in the class. Um, but then I said, OK, so I want you to put these mealies into a Ziploc packet and I gave them Ziploc packets with labels. And on the Ziploc uh, packet, they had to put their names, they had to put the amount of mealies. Suddenly, they had to be accountable, right? Because if I checked, they might be wrong. <laughs> Not that I would check. But so the next part of the next part, the next part, uh, yeah, no, this picture. Now, this picture is very significant <laughs> because some of the students counted in ones, right? Some of them put their mealies into three groups and three people counted their three mealies and they added them together. Others counted in twos, others counted in fives, others counted in tens, others counted and, and then put them together in fifties. And then this one, what is significant about this particular arrangement? I mean, you can't count those mealies, but I'll give you a clue. The biggest amount, the biggest pals are hundreds. The smaller ones are tens, and then there are a few ones, right? So here, we are coming to an understanding of maybe how place value developed eons ago, right? Now, for the little people, okay, so my students were doing this because in my class, we would do things that I think they might do one day in class, and then we'd reflect on them to say what is going on here. So imagine if little grade ones or grade twos have had this experience and you come up with uh, your hundreds, tens and units. This would be your illustration of, do you remember the hundreds, the tens and the units, right? But um, there's a lot more to place value than I'm saying now. I'm just saying that this was my attempt along the news lines to find a situation that might be meaningful and that might help the child to take a step in and then from there um, uh, go further. Okay, well, we didn't only count. We also weighed, right? We also weighed or uh, found the mass of, of these little um, packets. And then, and then we recorded the data, right? In the first column is the amount in each 
each, on each milli, the amount of milli pips on each milli. The second column is the mass. And then the third column is, is the average mass per milli pip. Right? And then, as you can see, we added and we divided and we, and we, and we divided and we did all kinds of things so, uh, in the class. And um, while for the, the, for the class, we raced through, right, and we talked about rates and we talked about all kinds of things, um, that there are, uh, on this milli, from this one millicob, there are a lot of situations, there are a lot of lessons that we can draw. We talked about estimation, we talked about rounding off in hundreds, we talked about rounding off in tens, we talked about why in some cases would you round in hundreds and other times round off in tens. Um, and then I talked to my colleague, Prof Lynetta, about this, and he suddenly started bringing calculus into this. And so <laughs> we thought that maybe we've got a project here. We can say, um, from counting to calculus, a hundred lessons from the millicob. <laughs> okay, so um, okay, so then, where am I now? I'm, I'm nearly at the end now. From a student teacher, right? This is a student teacher's uh, answer, uh, response after doing this. He said, personally, what makes me think I will make a difference as an education practitioner is that I had an influence from great mathematics teachers. And I'm not taking credit for this because he's been at, the, at UJ for three years, so he's had probably six great mathematics teachers in, at, at UJ. Um, I had an inf um, and I have a passion for mathematics and I have a new and innovative way of enriching the children's minds with mathematics. I want to incorporate more games into it, mathematics teaching, more engagement, like the project we did with the Mealies. It engaged us, but we did five or four concepts of mathematics. We counted, we grouped, we multiplied, we even calculated the averages, and we even engaged in, how can I say this, finding the hectares. Yeah, right. The end point was actually finding how many Mealies in a square meter, and then how many Mealies in a hectare, and so on. Um, for me, incorporating real life things into mathematics would, allow, would show the learners the purpose of mathematics, and that is what they need to know. Because growing up, when I was in grade 10, I did not know why we needed X in life. Now I understand why we need mathematics, so I want to enrich the children by showing them the purpose of mathematics and making them have fun while learning. Okay, so, this, uh, this, so the six components which we've been through, so I won't um, go th through that, is what I consider important in my maths education teaching. But there's something missing. Uh, there's probably quite a few things missing here. But this something missing, I'm looking at my colleague there. What's missing? Ask Maria Vass. <laughs> Language, right? <laughs> okay, so Maria, uh, about a year ago, I think, or 18 months ago, I was talking to Maria in the corridor. I said to Maria, I'm not really a language person. She said, everybody is a language person. You cannot not be a language person. And that woke me up. <laughs> and so, so, also now, you will see in my, my maths class, I ask my students th to um, explain things in five different languages. Now, for some of us, it's impossible. And one of our students actually said, how are you going to check, ma'am? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there are a lot of students who've got five or eight languages. Some, those coming from KwaZulu-Natal, have sometimes only got two, right? And then some of us, well. But um, <laughs> the way forward, I think teachers have to do away, this is another of my students, I think teachers have to do away with teaching mathematics as a far-fetched concept. They don't have to realize, I mean the learners, they don't have to realize they are actually learning. It has to happen unconsciously. Remember the dice game? That was fascinating. You saw everyone, they were actually learning but not realizing they are learning. So that is how the teaching approach for mathematics should be implemented. Okay, in summary, but remembering the new, that's the start, right? That's the play phase. 
Then you have to go to the precision phase. Then you have to go to the generalization phase. In summary, the notion of good education, teach empowerment and agency, reform mathematics, assessment and measurement, and a research approach all combined to contribute to maths teacher education, essentially a creative activity, where the first stages involve play, but then lead on to precision and generalization. Doing mathematics is a creative activity. I look forward to children having fun and learning at the same time. And I hope that the students that leave UJ uh, implement that process. Thank you for your attention. Good evening, everybody. How do you beat that? <laughs> I'd like to quote Henry Ford, who said, if you always do what you've always done, you're always, you'll always get what you've always got. But in a world that is changing at speeds that we have never seen before, perhaps if you always do what you've always done, you could in fact be going backwards. In a world where we seem to be mining more data than gold, where more people have mobile f a mobile phone than access to clean drinking water and electricity, where technology is changing the way we work, the way we think, and how we think, we cannot go about our business in the normal way. The coming industrial revolutions will bring about a staggering level of complexity in the way the world works and a need for humans to perform at intellectual levels never thought possible. And educators, and specifically mathematics educators, we really have our work cut out for us. Not only do our learners need to understand how to work with big data, they need to be discerning about the validity of knowledge, and they need to understand that knowledge is an ever-growing network where they are now a part of. This is why I'm particularly honored to respond to the work of Professor Caroline, Lo Caroline Long, who is certainly not doing things as they have always been done. Professor Long has shown that she is not afraid of interrogating the complexity that exists within teaching, within learning, and specifically the intricacies of mathematics learning. Some of you may feel uncomfortable at the thought of being in a mathematics classroom, but that's because Professor Long was not your teacher. Through her engagement with critical French texts, she paved the way for our understanding of conceptual fields and how conceptual fields open up learning spaces in our classrooms and open up possibilities for learners to engage more deeply with mathematics. In developing her own conceptual field of mathematics teacher education, she has carefully woven together essential elements. These elements have not come to her by chance, but rather as a result of her life's journey. Although her work is diverse, I believe that she has remained true to just what it means for our learners to be mathematical and to do mathematics. And in focusing on what it is our learners should be doing in a mathematics classroom, she has considered how we prepare our teachers for these classrooms. Professor Long's work suggested to me that teachers are no longer the explainers of procedures, but the designers of experiences. Teachers are no longer experts at mathematical exercises, but are more like engineers linking and building on learners' knowledge. We need teachers that are able to help our learners engage with ideas and not only answers. Professor Long pointed out that a single concept does not develop in isolation, but invariably develops with other concepts. One example is not enough to convey an entire concept. Oh, the textbook publishes here. Um, Sorry, she refers to multiplicative conceptual fields as an interrelated big idea in the intermediate phase curriculum. If proportional reasoning is seen as the, caps as the capstone of primary education and the cornerstone of secondary education, 
we need to produce teachers who can engage learners with rich multiplicative experiences and teachers who can build conceptual fields in their own classrooms. In Professor Long's work with assessment, she does not take the easy path. She asks difficult and critical questions and is not afraid to pursue and advance our understanding of them. She does not take mathematics assessment at face value. She interrogates the quality of assessment, enabling us not only to develop more robust assessment practices, but to think differently about the interrelatedness between learner and assessment. Although she approaches the idea of measurement critically and surgically, her rationale lies in what is best for learning mathematics. Professor Long has shown that she herself has taken the educational journey suggested by Whitehead. She has played with ideas, she has worked with them with exactness and precision, and she has abstracted them. I do feel that Professor Long has taken it one step further and that she comes back to where she started from, to the real life lived world of our learners and teachers. So Professor Long, may I be the first to congratulate you on this occasion and to say that the mathematics education community welcomes the acknowledgement of your journey and of your research. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, to become a full professor is quite a long and arduous journey. I would like to put it in three stages. The first stage is when you start your academic career, working towards that PhD, 2011 if I've got it correctly. Publications, good teaching, very important. Community engagement, giving back to society. Then the application processes as you follow it through the ranks. That approval that's got to be given by the executive of Senate to say that yes, Professor Long is good enough to be called a full professor. Then it's this lecture. But you would see something that when we entered into the procession, that some of us were overly dressed compared to Professor Long. <laughs> you see, she's not wearing a gown yet. And this is the last part of this pr process. And I'm going to call the Dean, Professor Long, to join me in front here. And this will be a very important part because we're going to roll Professor Long now. So welcome induction to the cohort of professors within the university.